We are here with Professor Carl Schneider, a lawyer and bioethicist and a professor of ethics, morality, and the practice of law at University of Michigan. After attending University of Michigan Law School, he served as law clerk to Justice Potter Stewart of the United States Supreme Court. Schneider has authored several books, including The Censor's Hand, The Misregulation of Human Subject Research. And what was that book you just mentioned from 25 years ago? <laughs> from 25 years ago. Uh, the Practice of Autonomy, whose subtitle is Patients, Doctors, and Medical Decisions. Carl, welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. You just told us this is your first podcast appearance, and uh, I'm sure it will not be your last. Well, what can I say? I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think it's very enterprising of the two of you to be doing this. All right. Do you have any financial disclosures before we get started? Every time I hear these these questions, and of course I get them all the time, I'm I'm always bemused because. Um, <laughs> my financial stake is sales of the book and you know five dollars seems like a lot to me so um in terms of, of book sales um but the reason i'm bemused is because there are a lot of things that make my judgment about these kinds of questions doubtful and those have to do with the fact that i've been thinking about this now for what 25 years and I've reached conclusions about a lot of things and I've put them into print and I'm deeply committed to a lot of them. Changing my mind with new evidence about those kinds of things is heroically difficult. The idea that I could be bought for any amount of money compared with the kinds of commitments I've made intellectually seems quite farcical to me. Yeah, it always seems like a, a big risk to put something into print, because once you've committed yourself publicly to a particular point of view, most people have a lot of trouble changing their mind. I've just been writing a book about um, a silly rule that governs the way that museums are run, um, and it has led me to wonder why so many bad rules get instituted in so many different kinds of places. The museum rule is one that is instituted by professional associations. Some of the things we'll be talking about are rules instituted by lawmakers. Um, they, the puzzle I've had over the 45 years or so that I've been a lawyer is how do these patently bad ideas get put into practice and stay there so tenaciously? So um, I think that part of the reason is that people underestimate how hard it is to write good rules. They say there ought to be a law. And with the IRBs, they say research subjects shouldn't be abused. So we'll have a rule that says don't abuse research subjects and we will ensure that no subject is abused by setting up this agency that will protect us. Um, but what this means is you're suggesting, and we know this from all kinds of research in behavioral economics um, and in psychology, is that once people adopt a position, it's extremely difficult to shake their minds with any new evidence. Um, there are a massive number of studies um, in which people are presented with evidence contrary to their position, and they find ways of finding that the evidence confirms their position. So just jumping back for a second to your background on this particular topic, uh, how did you get interested in writing about human subject research? I had actually planned never to become interested in that topic um, because everything I saw about it was alarming. Um, I actually started off as a law professor teaching as my area of specialization, uh, family law. But um, after 10 years of doing that and finding it um, a very fraught area because of subjects like abortion, and, um, I thought, why not do something that would be more fun and that would give me more scope for doing empirical work? Um, well, you know the famous story about 
uh, one of the Medici popes on becoming pope, he said, the papacy is ours, let us enjoy it. And I thought that's a very good approach to, to making professional choices as well. Um, so I, I thought about a lot of fields and decided that law and medicine would be particularly interesting. And I began visiting over at the, um, at the hospital where people were very welcoming. And um, I started off by hanging around a dialysis unit because one of the things that permeates uh, family law is law and medicine is this idea of autonomy. And I thought I would write a book about how patients made medical decisions with their families because I assumed there was a large literature on how patients made decisions and that what I would bring to it was the family side of things. Well, I began to read and I discovered that there is nothing written about how patients actually take information and make decisions. So I backed up a step and said, uh, well, I guess I better try to think about how patients made medical decisions. So. I interviewed patients, their families, social workers, nutritionists, physicians, of course, nurses in the dialysis unit to try to get multiple views about how patients address the medical decisions they had. Because the ideology of the unit was very strongly in favor of patient autonomy. Their mantra was, our patients make their own medical decisions. Now, to divert it for just a moment, um, that wasn't true. It was true that they wanted patients to decide what modality of dialysis to choose because they thought it was more a social decision than a medical decision. At the time, at least, um, they were medically indifferent to the modality. Um, but the practicalities of, you know, do you come into the clinic three times a week? Do you, can you manage the machine at home? Um, were important to them. Um, so they made a big deal about the patients choosing the modality of dialysis, but every other medical decision was treated as a, as a very ordinary sort of decision that was made in whatever ways the doctors and patients together made decisions. And I interviewed one patient who was fully imbued with the, we make our own decisions. And so I said, so how did you decide what kind of dialysis to have, and she explained it. Then I said, you've told me you also have problems controlling your blood pressure. How have you decided how to treat your blood pressure? Because there are a lot of different um, approaches you can take. And she said, oh, I leave that kind of thing up to my doctor. And I thought that caught a lot about how patients made um, medical decisions. So um, I was trying to figure out more about how patients made medical decisions. One of the nice things about doctors is that they want data. And they're like economists that way. Um, and unlike bioethicists, they want to know whether we can figure out what's going on. Now, unfortunately, the only way that doctors think that you can get information is by stud quantitative studies. Um, but, but, I discovered that there were these quantitative studies that spoke directly to questions like, who, do you want to make your own medical decisions? So I read all the, all the studies I could get my hands on. And then rather by accident, I came across a genre of literature I didn't know existed. And that is the books that upper middle class people who have become seriously ill write about their experience. I began to think it was a social norm that if you were that kind of person with that kind of illness, you had to write something about it to be able to keep your head high in, in polite society. 
And those were very, those were thoughtful and articulate people who had been through a lot and who really wanted to tell you what it had been like. And it's a very rich source. It's biased, of course, because they tend to be upper middle class, overeducated people. But there are also, if you look hard enough, there are also um, uh, some of the same kinds of books by people who had very few economic and educational resources. So the this became the book I described earlier, the um, practice of autonomy book, um, in which I argued that the mechanical way in which medical students are told to approach patients. Patients are autonomous. We present them with the data. They make their own decisions was laughably wrong. Um, it just, the world doesn't work like this. Doctors have to treat the entire range of the human population. And there isn't anything remotely like the kind of uniformity that would allow the system of informed consent to work. So, um, so this is a long answer to your question, but I am getting there. Um, so I wrote this book and um, then actually um, became interested in the general question of how well the idea of what we call mandated disclosure works. Mandated disclosure is a legal rule that requires one party to a transaction, the doctor in our case, to give information to the other party to the transaction, the patient in our case, so that the less sophisticated party can make a good decision. And as um, I eventually wound up writing a book with a colleague who's a lawyer and an economist at Chicago. And we argued that there is no situation in which a law requiring one party to give information to the other party has achieved the goal set for it. So then I wanted to collaborate with a friend of mine on something and he said, let's do research ethics. So we said, we'll write an article. He was an MD JD. Um, so we thought first we'll write something for a medical journal. But the more we looked at it, the more indignant and disbelieving we became. And it turned into a law review article. A law review article is typically 50, 70, 80, 120 pages long. Um, and you can see that that easily became a book. So th that is a long answer to your short question. One topic you brought up was informed consent. And given the difficulties of conveying information to patients, both because of time constraints, because of patient interest in understanding their medical conditions and the limitations of conveying an enormous amount of information in a relatively short period of time, that informed consent is something that you don't actually believe is possible. Before we get into that, can you define what informed consent is? Well, in, informed consent, of course, is the idea that patients are entitled to make their own decisions, that they can't make decisions unless they have the information needed to make the decision in a thoughtful and rational way, and that therefore the physician should provide the patient with the information the patient needs for making the decision. It sounds very pleasing. Um, lots of people believe it, but, and I've seen doctors who not only think that it's desirable, but think that it is morally obligatory for the patient to make his or her own decision. So let me give you an example of this. Come, comes from the world of dentistry, but so my dentist says, you may need a root canal. 
And in my day, root canals were very painful procedures. Um, so I was not happy, but I went to the endodontist and the endodontist did what endodontists do and then presented his findings to me. And I said, well, that's interesting, but do I need a root canal? And he said, well, that's your decision. And I said, yes, I am aware of that, but, um, but do I need one? And he said, no, it's really your decision. So I said what most patients say, were it your tooth, what would you do? And he said, my values may be different from your values, so I won't tell you what I would do. This is your decision. So I tried to figure out what he would have done if it were his own tooth, and we did that. I, I did try to think about whether I had any values that were relevant to the question of whether I wanted a root canal or not, and I found I had none. I just wanted to know whether I needed a root canal or not. So it turned out as I began to read into bioethics that this really represented one non-trivial strand of thinking about informed consent, that, that if you are going to be a human being in the proper sense of the term, it was your responsibility to take on your own decisions, to develop your own values, and then to implement those values in making decisions. Now, part, I just have to say, part of the unreality of this is the same problem I had. They don't have relevant values. People don't spend their lives developing values and then trying to apply them. People go about their day-to-day -day routines trying to do the things that they are interested in and enjoy doing and not developing values. The other problem is that, um, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, um, general principles do not resolve concrete cases. Even if I had had va values, trying to figure out how my abstract values applied to this question of a root canal would have been a very difficult and artificial business. So, so that's what informed consent is. And, and what I'm saying that I think isn't as often noticed is that when doctors are trained, uh, they often are given some sense that you really ought to get patients to make their own decisions. Yeah, I think you, you brought up a lot. I, I think that at least what I was taught and what I've seen now is an emphasis on what they call shared decision making. So like for most of medical history, it was all paternalism. The doctor would say, you need to do X, and then the patient would do X. And then I think that there was a period of time, maybe it's sort of overlapping what you're describing, where the new role of the doctor was no longer to give specific advice, it was being a technical advisor. And you kind of lay out all the options and say, what are your values and how do they you know, intersect with these different decisions that could be made? And now it's sort of synthesizing those two different viewpoints into a you know, a so-called shared decision. And, you know, the, the way I've seen this in practice is, I mean, the most common thing that people have to get at least forms filled out for in, informed consent has to do with uh, giving blood, like giving someone a transfusion. And, you know, some people are very good at going over the risks and some people not so good, you know? So, and I've seen them all, but ultimately I haven't seen anyone saying, no, I don't want the blood transfusion, uh, they pretty much go along with what you're recommending. Although I have uh, recommended a procedure to someone uh, like getting a CT scan and he, he declined it. Um, so it's not like it's impossible for a patient to, to say, no, he, does, he, he or she doesn't want something. But I, I think that the, I'm just bringing all this up to kind of say that things have, have maybe developed from the, the days of of just being a technical advisor. 
what have they developed into? I mean, I'm not at all clear that shared decision making, as it is described, is really any different from informed consent as it was described. Um, I think that uh, there is a huge medical literature on the failures of informed consent. Um, field after field after field, you have the neurologist who is going to tell the patient what the laminectomy is. And so you have these extraordinary, extravagant exercises in education where the neurosurgeon meets with the patient using audiovisual aids and showing the patient what the laminectomy is and discussing the risks. Then the patient is sent to a nurse educator who is specially trained in informing patients, and she goes through the process. Then there is a third meeting. You can see how realistic it is, um, and in which the neurosurgeon and the family and the patient meet and go over the same thing. Then you give patients a test to see how well they have learned it. And if you give them um, an open-ended choice, they will get about 50% of the answers to simple questions correct. And this is just the norm. Everywhere you go, when you have doctors and researchers who are truly committed to making this work and who fail all the time. And so, I think that informed consent advocates had to deal with the fact that it didn't work. Um, and also, I should say, deal with the fact that patients didn't want it to work that way. And so they moved to a different lingo, but it's not clear to me how much the informed consent idea and the shared decision-making idea really were different, even in the way they're described, but certainly in the way they were actually carried out. You mentioned that most patients don't actually want informed consent to work that way. What do you mean by that? What is it that patients actually want? Well, the book I described earlier, The Practice of Autonomy, um, was really ultimately driven by my question whether patients wanted informed consent in the way that it was understood. And I found studies that suggested that they wanted information in quite large numbers, but that they didn't plan to use that information making decisions and didn't especially want to make their own decisions. Um, so there was uh, one study in which patients were asked, do you want to make your own decisions? And on a zero, meaning I don't want to make them all, to 100, meaning I want to make everything, um, the, um, the average response was 33. It's a little hard to make sense of that. But they also asked on the same scale, do you want information? And there, the average was 80. So there was a very clear interest in information and a very modest desire to grab the nettle of decision. So what is the alternative to informed consent? Like, let's the, say we no longer have informed consent as a requirement during medical decision making. What, what replaces it? Well, in my dreams, people. Um, one of the things I find most irksome about the subjects we're discussing, like IRBs and informed consent, is that people say, what is the alternative? They want an alternative formula. They want an alternative regulatory scheme. And one of the things that lawyers learn early on is that there are not good solutions to a lot of human problems. And the fascination with trying to find a quick and dirty way of describing how things should be um, is dangerous. <laughs>
So I don't think there is any good way of telling doctors how they should work with patients in making decisions. Um, I, I think that one of the best ways of doing it is to cause the physician to become seriously ill for a protracted period and have the physician be the patient. Physicians themselves testify to how powerful that is in changing their approach to informing patients. But as I, as I um, said to you either during our recording or shortly before it, patients, the category of patients is the entire population of mankind. And there is such a range of variation on every axis that I cannot imagine a way of describing what should be done by a physician except to try to treat the patient as humanely as possible and to try to figure out by working with the patient what the best way of making the decision, this decision in this case is. I mean, uh, one of the stories that I tell medical students, I used to teach medical students, um, is the story of my of my father, who um, was a political scientist. He had a PhD. He was terminally well educated and um, very bright. Um, at the age of 92, when he was entirely compass mentis, his local cardiologist told him that he had congestive heart failure and that he would die in six months. Well, I'm no physician, but I've lived with physicians now for a long time. And what they all said was, my God, get that man to an academic medical center. Who is this local guy? What does he know? It's so fortunately, they lived about 50 miles from Johns Hopkins. We drove him down to Johns Hopkins, um, where his cardiologist is one of the people who had developed the echocardiogram. And we met with him, and he said, well, you do have congestive heart failure. You will die in, a, in half a year, but why die if you don't have to? We have a young surgeon here, meaning about 50, um, who does minimally invasive heart surgery. Why don't you do that? So we heard about minimally invasive, <laughs> minimally invasive heart surgery, which means going in through the ribs on the right side and repairing the mitral valve. Um, and we drove home and my father and I were sitting in the living room and he said, so do you think I should have this surgery? And I said, yes. And he said, okay. And that was the end of his reflection on whether he should have this surgery or not. Now, when I tell this story, the attending, teaching the class and the students are likely to be horrified. That wasn't informed consent. That wasn't shared decision-making. That was not respecting his autonomy. That was not giving him all the information because as I knew when I said it, the surgery could go badly wrong. He could be in an ICU in horrible shape for months and die miserably. And I would have told him that if he had, <laughs> if he had shown some signs of wanting to know it, but and I still don't know what was going on in his mind. But I thought what I had thought about my own um, endodontist experience, that when I talked to the endodontist, I was quite irritated with him because I had told him how I wanted to make the decision. To me, the relevant information was his advice or what he would do with his own tooth. He wouldn't tell me that. So I thought that he was dishonoring my autonomy because he wouldn't let me make the decision the way I wanted to. And I thought my father was quite capable of asking questions if he wanted to. And I thought 
that he would ask that he, since I'd known him very well, um, would ask questions if he wanted to. And if he didn't, then I would tell him what I thought he should do. But it it sits very badly with a lot of med medical educators when I say this. So let me see if I, I understand your perspective here. You're, you're saying you think that informed consent may be useful in certain circumstances with certain people, but it shouldn't be so much dictated by law, but more just a norm perhaps that's adopted by doctors in certain circumstances as they, as they see that it's actually useful, like informing patients when the questions are asked or, or giving enough information such that they could make the decision, but then picking up on cues as far as whether the patient actually just wants the decision to be made for them or by another family member? Well, of course, part of the problem is patients do not articulate to themselves in any serious way how they want to make medical decisions. Um, they just haven't thought about it enough. Um, and part of the problem is that there really isn't a category called medical decision. Um, there is um, a category in which patients interact with doctors to decide what to do, but some of those are purely technical decisions. Which, which way do we want to treat? Which way can we use that will actually reduce his blood pressure? There are other decisions like, do you want us to keep you alive that are not technical decisions? They're questions about whether you want to be alive into these circumstances. And there, patients do have opinions, um, not, not irrebuttable preferences, um, because part of the problem is for that what the patient, one of the reasons patients want decisions without wanting to make, sorry, want information without wanting to make decisions is that they want to understand what their life is going to be like. And what they want is information directed at, at finding out how they're going to be living, what kind of problems they're going to have, which aren't relevant to making a dis may not be relevant to making a decision, but are relevant to their dealing with with their illness. So, so you can't just ask a patient, where are you on this scale of wanting to make your own decision? Uh, because patients haven't thought about it, and because it, it turns out that medical decisions is a very complicated and various category. Um, the, the impossibility question, I think, is centrally important. Um, the impossibility problem being that you can't bring a patient up to the level of being able to make an expert decision. And there are certainly situations in which patients can get enough information to feel comfortable in making a decision, but education doesn't work. This is a deep truth about human life. It doesn't work, but it's everybody's preferred solution to everything. The reason I say it doesn't work is because I've spent 40 years trying to help people learn to be lawyers. They are selected for their skill, for their aptitude in learning law. That's what the LSAT predicts. Predicts how well you'll do in law school. They are very bright. They have powerful reasons to want to learn what I'm trying to teach them because they want a good, prestigious job and they can only get it in, in law if they get really good grades. And I give them their grades. So, they have lots of reasons to want to do what I'm trying to teach them, quite apart from the fact that I have really good reasons. I, what I'm about 
is to try to help them learn to analyze legal problems well. Because law school is not about teaching people rules. Those are easy to learn. Law school is about teaching you to think like a lawyer. So I spend my life trying to help students over the problems that I know people have in learning how to think like a lawyer. And I know they have these problems because I've been grading exams for 40 years. I know exactly where they're going to go wrong. I Every year I start off and I say, this year, they're not going to make those simple-minded mistakes. I'm going to teach them how to do this so at least they won't do those things again. And it never works. It never works. Law school itself is a very effective way of teaching people to think like lawyers. It's a socialization process in which all they do month after month is practice analyzing legal problems. And guaranteed, they're completely different at the end of the first year. That, so in that sense, it works. But trying to get people to move from their own initial level of aptitude to a more sophisticated one is an extraordinarily difficult business. And they make mistakes even in reciting back to me the rules of law. Now, if under these ideal circumstances, they have that much trouble learning what I'm trying to teach them, and I have that much trouble trying to teach them what they need to know, what are the chances that in one encounter between a doctor and a patient, any kind of useful education is going to go on? Particularly since sane doctors aren't just about, I mean, no doctor is just about giving patients information. You're also trying to get them to do what you want them to do and what they want to do. I mean, you've got to, we all know what the levels of compliance are with even taking your pills in the morning. So the idea that we're somehow going to bring patients up to speed in making a decision, given the basic difficulties of education, strikes me as fatuous. Second, I said that I'd written a book on, on mandated disclosure on these attempts to require that one party to a transaction, doctors or the Miranda rule, when, when, when you're arrested, they say you have a right to remain silent, you have a right. That's another example of mandated disclosure. Um, when you click on, um, I accept the terms of eBay's contract with me, that's another kind of mandated disclosure. Well, my co-author and I could not find a single circumstance in which those rules worked. So it isn't that there is something special about informed consent. It's that none of these rules work. And they don't work partly because people will not take on the educational task. They may say, my privacy is really important to me, but they're never going to read the privacy disclosure. Furthermore, they can't. Most people are not literate enough to read these disclosures. To be in the 80th percentile in literacy, all you have to be able to do is to understand um, the definition of peremptory challenge. You don't have to know what peremptory means. You just have to be able to understand the definition of a peremptory challenge to a juror. Um, furthermore, print out the eBay contract that, that has to be disclosed to you. In eight point font, which I can no longer read because it's so small, printed out, my colleague and I did this, we then taped the pages together so that it was a kind of long scroll. My colleague stood on the balcony in the library at the University of Chicago and released the scroll. It's 32 feet long. 
people do not read that. Um, you say, well, of course, that's not something that a sane person would read. But um, another kind of mandated disclosure is the disclosures you get, you probably haven't done this yet, when you buy a house, take a mortgage, and the terms of the mortgage and lots of other things have to be disclosed to you at the closing. So my co-author remortgaged his house. He's, he teaches contracts. He could understand these disclosures. Did he read them? No. I have taught property for 40 years. I can understand the disclosures. Did I read them? No. Um, no, nobody reads them, partly because the person who's running the the, disclo the uh, closing wants to go home and have dinner. Um, and But mostly because people do not think that it's worth their time to take these problems on. And so they do not read any of the disclosures. If they do read them, they don't understand them. If they do understand them, they typically find that they really don't have a live choice anyway, which is very often true in informed consent, of course. So, so I think it's a bad mistake to see informed consent as a special problem. It is just a species of the genus mandated disclosure. And we do not live our lives informing ourselves about important things and then making a decision about them. So, just to stick with the doctor informed consent version of this, for people who are making a medical decision, it makes sense to me that for most people, it may not matter. But for the small percent of people, 10% of people who both understand and require that information in order to make a decision, shouldn't we, shouldn't we still stick with the current processes for that person? And you don't know who's going to be in that category versus the other category. Well, I think what, what you have to do is essentially try to feel out the patient as you go along and see how much the patient seems to want um, and how much the patient seems to be understanding. Um, and, you know, you, you do that naturally anyway you you're looking at the person you're talking to you're trying to see whether you're getting signals that suggest interest and signals that suggests actual comprehension and but i mean one of the classic decisions is the decision about what kind of treatment to have for prostate cancer and what you quickly discover is that it's a bottomless pit from the patient's point of view. So you say, um, the risks of surgery are impotence and incontinence. And so a thoughtful, inquisitive patient is likely to say, well, impotence isn't a category, it's a continuum. So how bad is that going to be? And then, and of course, part of the answer is, well, we can't really say in advance. It depends how things go. Um, then he says, well, so if I, if I am impotent, can you treat it? And then, then what you get is, yes, let me give you the informed consent about treating impotence. There are a range of things we can do, and they work in the following ways. And you so you're one after another you're confronted with more questions about the initial information so what uh, i'm not a i'm not a nihilist um i i think that it's possible to work with human beings to try to help them come to the next step that they should take. And sometimes that will mean saying, this is what I recommend. Uh, happened with my father. Um, sometimes it will mean 
you know, they've read up on it in advance. They're really interested. They want to know more. You can give them things to read. If they're really sophisticated, you can give them medical journal articles to read. Sufficiently weird patients will like that. I'm, I'm one myself. I don't pretend that I know how to make a medical decision, but I'm interested. And um, so, so I like it when I get a lot of information, partly because I just think it's kind of interesting and I'm interested in how people make medical decisions and my doctors know this. So, so we're ha part of our conversation is, you know, how should we make this kind of medical decision? But you don't, most of your patients aren't like that. And for most of them, it's really a question of trying to figure out what they don't know, trying to figure out what they don't understand, fixing those problems if the patients want them to be fixed. But a lot of the time, there just isn't an ideal way of dealing with this problem. Let me say one more thing. One advantage that doctors have that, that patients don't, however sophisticated the patient is, is that they have a sense of how medical issues work out, and they have experience with the trajectory of, of particular illnesses. Um, so um, it's well known, at least um, it was in my day, that um, Many people think they would rather die than have a colostomy, but people who have colostomies, which is almost everybody who's ever um, offered one, um, winds up thinking that it was not as horrible as they expected. It, but it's, see, it's very hard to understand how you could wind up thinking that before you've had the experience. So it's a lot easier to make decisions if you have experience with them, and the physician has at least the experience of having watched people live through the consequences of these decisions and have the illnesses and have the treatments. And that's a, that's a real advantage. We started off this discussion with going into your background of going into the dialysis uh, center to write a book about how patients made decisions. And um, the book that we were interested in discussing today was The Sensor's Hand, you eventually came from that to writing about institutionalized review boards. How did you end up writing the book to finish the story, writing about IRBs? And then I guess from there, we'll move on to what IRBs are and what they do. As we started this process of just writing an article on, on IRBs, um, it, it in, we, we're faced with the absence of information about how IRBs make decisions. Nobody knows how IRBs work. That's a, what lawyers call a black box. The jury is a black box. They, you give them all this information and they say, guilty, not guilty, libel, not libel. And you, you have no idea what produced it. Um, same thing is true of IRBs. Well, so to a lawyer, what you have here is a governmental agency. And what we want of governmental agencies is that they make good decisions. And we know something about what leads governmental agencies to make good decisions. They have to be staffed with able people who are good at making that kind of decision. They have to get good and reliable information. They have to have a way of analyzing problems, which means they have to generate dispute. You, you cannot reach good policy conclusions by um, a process that does not involve disagreement, because disagreement is the only way that you surface um, the kinds of problems that um, inevitably arise when you're trying to regulate society. Um, and you have to have good procedures. You have to have good decision-making procedures. You have to have good evidence-collecting procedures. Um, 
And you have to treat people properly. You have to treat people well because government owes that to citizens and because the best way to get citizens to work with you is to treat them well and not to treat them like dirt. So what we want is for the IRB to make good decisions. And what we began to ask was, first, how are these people making decisions? And the answer was, we have no idea. Um, so the next thing we ask is, well, how well situated are the people in IRBs to make good decisions? And the answer to that was increasingly that they are entirely incompetent to make good decisions. Um, there was a time when IRBs were composed of the ablest people on a faculty. That lasted a very short time. You're the dean of a medical school. Are you going to appoint your best researcher to be on an IRB where he spends hours and hours of time a week looking at somebody else's research? No, you're not going to do it partly because that's a terrible use of your best people and partly because your best people won't do it. There are lots of IRBs, our research suggested, in which there are no full professors. Well, what that means is full professors are saying no. And that's easier for full professors to do in other parts of the university. Medical school is the most hierarchical part. Um, but deans and law schools and, and history departments don't have that kind of leverage over faculty members. Um, so what happens is that the IRB becomes bureaucratized. And that means decisions essentially get to be in the hands of staff. So in the part of society in which the level of expertise is overall the highest, in a university where you have people who are experts at very potentially very high levels in their fields, are being evaluated. Their work is being evaluated by people who do not have any training in the field at all. So, and this at a time when IRBs are in, have for some time been increasingly expected to evaluate the quality of the research as well as the um, supposed ethics of the research. And what we know about the quality of their decisions is that they are aleatory, that they are, they look from the outside like decisions made by chance. And the way that that was clearest was from uh, looking at multi-site studies where you had 30 different IRBs all confronted with exactly the same protocol and reaching wildly different conclusions about the protocol. So um, a a friend of mine was um, part of a study to evaluate the effectiveness of vitamin A supplements for extremely low birth weight babies. The IRB at, this was a study being done by exceptionally able um, neonatologists and they were at exceptionally fine schools. One of those exceptionally fine schools said, this is an unethical study because everybody already knows that vitamin A supplementation is necessary. The school most in competition with school A had an IRB that said, this is unethical because everybody knows that you shouldn't use vitamin A supplements. Now, any system of government agencies that produces this kind of disparity. And just in the vitamin A study, there is a long list of other disparities is clearly an agency that is not making rational decisions. So, so they're not qualified by people. They have no good way of gathering information partly because they don't understand information well enough, and partly because what you get is these endlessly long forms, which become the fixation. You have 
often no way even for the um, investigator to speak to the people who are actually making the decision because the staff is in the way. You have no due process at all. If, if you were a convicted rapist and murderer coming up for parole, you would have a long list of due process rights. If you are an eminent researcher in a socially useful field, the IRB can deny you your ability to do any work and you have no way to speak to them. You have no right to address them. You have no rights of any of the standard kinds of due process that every governmental agency has to use in some combination. You're, you're, there is no situation in American government where citizens are treated as contemptuously as they are in front of IRBs. And the problem is that it's partly, if human dignity is important as they say it is, then they really ought to treat you with some human dignity. Um, but the other problem is, it means they're not getting good information. The reason we have due process isn't just to treat people fairly, it's to give, to make sure that the agency making the decision has good information. And that does not apply to IRBs. So we, we know that the main result of IRBs is, well, the two kinds of results. One is what they do is they make sure that every year the informed consent form on average gets longer. That's their principal accomplishment. And they do it well, steadily longer and longer forms. And what we know about longer forms is the longer the form, the less likely it will be read and the less likely it will be understood. And we know that they don't read the forms anyway and don't care. Um, my own experience, um, I, I've done ethnographic research since I was in college. Uh, it's really fun. Americans want to tell you about their lives. If you ask them, the problem isn't digging the information out, it's stopping the flow. So it's, and that, that makes it really interesting and really fun. And, and you, the part of the real problem you have as an ethnographer is that not that you abuse the research subjects, you, you, you really think you've come to understand something important about their lives. You like them, you want them to succeed. It's very hard when you're doing the actual writing of the book to be honest about their flaws. You like them too much, you want them to be happy. So, um, so the very idea that researchers are the, are the natural enemies of research subjects is just not an accurate description of of how people work. Um, I'm sorry that I got off on a tangent. Where did you want me to go? Yeah, so we just wanted to summarize what IRBs are and what oh. they do, and then from there you sort of already jumped into the more yes. detailed analysis of what. Well, they you do. asked you asked me what how the process of of writing the book went, and I, and I was basically telling you why we got madder and madder the more we worked on the problem. Um, we just couldn't believe that it, everything we found out made it worse and worse and worse and less and less comprehensible. So an IRB is a institution run by university or hospital um, that is required by the federal government that is supposed to review research studies to see if they are going to harm the subjects of the research. Um, what happens in reality is that um, they have become a major barrier to accomplishing research. 
Um, and the barrier doesn't always mean that it stops research completely. It usually doesn't mean that, but it means that the research is damaged, that it isn't as good as it would have been um, left to its own devices, and that it takes much longer and costs much more. I mean, so the question that a lawyer asks is partly, is this agency making good decisions? And I've suggested some of the reasons why IRBs do not make good decisions. Um, lawyers also ask, first question about regulation, does this regulation do more good than harm? If it doesn't do more good than harm, you shouldn't have the regulation, period. There is no argument for regulating society to make it worse. So the question that, that no advocate of the IRB system has ever addressed is whether IRBs do more good than harm. And they, the answer is they don't. They result in morbidity and mortality because they get in the way of research that can save lives and improve health. Yeah, this is uh, something that Alex Tabarrok, who's an economist at George Mason, calls the invisible graveyard. Uh, he uses it in the context of the FDA, but I think it just as well applies here, where you know, if, it if you delay research such that something takes an extra couple of years in order to become widely available and it ends up helping people, <clears throat> in the interim, people are, are dying or suffering who are not getting it, but yet no, it's hard to point a finger exactly at someone. It, it's harder to draw the line of causality to the delay than it is if you approve something that ends up causing that harm afterwards. But I want to I want to talk a little bit more about the history of IRBs. Can you can you describe how they came to be and what some of the logic was behind the uh, layering of regulation on top of human subject researchers? Well, I can't answer all of that question because um, the justificatory work was never done. What happened was that, to simplify egregiously, um, the Tuskegee study, um, which had been a, was a New Deal program to study um, what happened if syphilis was left untreated. And the study population was black. And the um, even after the point at which it became possible to treat tertiary syphilis um, with something, um, uh, no treatment was provided. And people disagree about every aspect of it, but the um, a possibility that there were elderly black men who were ill with a horrible disease and not treated in a government program, um, understand, understandably created a lot of um, uh, unhappiness. And Congress had hearings and instead of writing a rule, or passing a law, it told HHS to make a rule. HHS said, and I am paraphrasing here because it didn't actually utter words, you mean we get to write a rule that gives us control over all human subject research in the United States forever? Let's be sure that we take advantage of this and give ourselves as much power as we can so that, so that we make sure that everything works properly, and we make sure that Congress never blames us for anything going wrong. And that was the origin of the IRB system. Um, in the process of setting up this system, um, ev almost every decision that was made expanded the authority of the decision. So I've talked with the social scientist who was on one of the initial committees. Um, and 
the consensus was that Congress had not had social science research in mind, but that they hadn't really prevented HHS from asserting authority over social science research. And so they did. And then you had a system in which you had these agencies who were supposed to prevent bad things from happening. And in fairness to the IRBs, they were not given the kind of instruction that the FDA is, is at least formally given, which is weigh the benefits against the risks. The IRBs were told prevent risks. And so, and of course, from the IRB's point of view, nothing bad happens if you say no to the research. Something terrible happens if you say yes to the research and there is a problem. So their incentive structure is to say no, or to create so many safeguards and difficulties that they can say that they did all could be done to prevent problems. So, so in the middle of universities whose functioning is impossible without free inquiry, you have what I call a censorship agency that decides whom you can talk to, what kind of questions you can ask, what kind of information you can get, and how you can, in what ways you can publish your results. It's a system of not just research regulation, but a system of censorship of inquiry and of publication of a kind that would have seemed that would have seemed incredible in a university um, until the last few decades. And I say this partly because I'm a third generation academic. So, so I've been observing how uh, uh, universities work forever since 1948. So IRBs get started in, I think it was the early 70s after the Tuskegee revelations. Yeah, the Tuskegee report was in 1972. 72. And then over the years, it gets sort of added to a standard that all, all universities in the country or any organization that receives governmental funds has to have an institutional review board if they're doing any sort of research with humans, whether it be social science, just asking people a couple of questions, all the way up to taking you know, new medications for deadly diseases. And you know, all of these things are not in, not treated entirely the same, but uh, the same general rules tend to apply across that spectrum. And there are, there are many anecdotes that you present in your book of people having to deal with institutional review boards for things that I don't think any sane person would agree required the amount of uh, paperwork and hoop jumping. So for example, one of the, the stories you relate is this woman who wants to study, I think it was a neonatologist who's studying extremely low birth weight babies in the NICU. And it's observed that when parents can visit the NICU more often, the children do better. And so she's like, okay, well, what if we took all of the people with NICU babies and we gave half of them free parking and the other half, we just leave it as it is. It was like $10 a day. And then we'll see if that improves outcomes for the babies, because it's very expensive to have a baby in the NICU. It can take, you know, I think it was the average was like three months and you, you have multiple pages of all of the interactions that she had to have with the IRB, all of the hoops she had to jump through just to give free parking to half of the patients. And this, you know, this is just one of many stories that you relate, but I, I, I feel like that type of insanity is, is rife within the IRB complex. So 
just to just to sort of like define some of the terms that you use in your book, you you use the word or the term event licensing. And so I was wondering if you could just expand on what event licensing is and what are alternatives to event licensing that IRBs could use. Uh, stating first that I think IRB should be abolished. Um, I cannot imagine any function they can serve without doing more harm than good. Partly because the way that IRBs were first set up was relatively rational, but the incentive structure, as I was suggesting earlier, drives them to be more and more imperialistic, drives them to to inquire into every detail and to try to protect everybody through these informed consent informed consent forms. So we've already seen a relatively rational IRB system and what it turns into is what we've got. Um, so I'm an abolitionist um, and I will say up front, the proper question is not, but if you abolish them, what will you do instead? The proper question is, is there any reason to think these agencies do more good than harm? If not, they're doing more harm than good and they should be gotten rid of. It, um, in the book, um, I say that um, when doctors decided it was no longer useful to bleed people for everything, the response was to stop bleeding people. It wasn't to say, well, we're gonna keep bleeding people until we have something better. So, um, I'm sorry, now, see, you got me off. Um, event licensing, me, event, event licensing. Licensing. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, when lawyers think about regulation, they say, what, is our, what are our ways of regulating? What is the way that regu to regulate that will produce the most good for the least cost? Um, and almost always, that means that we say to people, this is how you should behave. And if you don't, we will make you sorry. And we may well require you to make the people whole whom you damaged. The, one of the alternatives to sanctioning people, punishing people who do harm um, is to license people to engage in activities. So physicians are licensed. You can't become a physician without being licensed. But once you're licensed, you can do all the terrible things that researchers do all the time and without having to go with an IRB. The, and I've often thought that the um, proper analogy to an IRB is a treatment review board because doctors are much more dangerous than researchers and they can make treatment decisions on any basis they want to. So because they're so much more dangerous than researchers, they really ought not to be allowed to treat a patient in any way without having the prior approval of a treatment board to make sure that they're not going astray. Um, now, the one reason this doesn't happen is because it's so obviously doing more harm than good. But, um, but the interesting thing about doctors, lawyers, lots of other people, is that once they're given a license to do something, they're expected to go off and do it. And if they screw up, then you have malpractice actions or a board that sanctions people who did wrong. The weird and costly thing about IRBs is that you don't license researchers to do research. You license each particular act of the research in it so that you have to get permission in advance before engaging on any project. That's the most expensive way of regulating anything. It, it's as though research were nuclear power and you thought it was so dangerous that you had to do everything you could to make sure that nothing ever went wrong. 
And this is the device that gives you the most control over what researchers do, and therefore is the most likely to, to slow and desirable research. So it's expensive that way. And it, the process itself is extremely expensive. I mean, researchers' time is very expensive stuff. And monetarily, as well as in the benefits that they can produce. So um, it's a event licensing is a kind of regulation that we almost never use because it is prima facie so expensive. Yeah, to follow up on one of your points there, one of the more frustrating parts of reading the book was just realizing that if a doctor wants to prescribe X versus Y, and, and there's genuine ambiguity as far as whether X or Y is better, they can just do it. But the second they decide that they want to record their data and see which one is better in a systematic way, then all of this extra work has to be done. So one of the, the examples that you give is, um, I think it was like cord clamping early versus late when someone's having a baby delivered. And this is something, uh, I don't know if it's, if it's been settled since 2015, but there's genuine equipoise as far as which one was better. And so, uh, you know, some providers are like, we could do it always early or they make a personal judgment, but then they attempted to actually study this. Okay, we actually don't know which one's better. So we'll assign half of the, the providers to do this or half of the people to get this uh, early versus late. And then it became, I think it was even impossible for them to actually do the study given all of the difficulties that then mounted up. But I Almost guess- all of the studies in the book fit into that in that category, the free parking study, the low birth weight, um, uh, vitamin A supplementation, these were all situations in which nobody, nobody, they were doing the study because there were two standard ways of doing it. And any physician in practice was free to take one extreme or the other. But as soon as you actually try to take advantage of the two ways of doing it and see which one is better, then you can't do it anymore. It's the hospital was always free to give out a thousand dollars in free parking. And I should say that is, I found one of the most painful things, the free parking, one of the most painful, the woman who was doing the study was essentially in tears because she said these People who have these extremely low birth weight babies are not prosperous upper middle class parents. They're poor. They've got lots of other problems. They have, they're desperate to see their kids and they can't afford the $10 a day for the parking. And I figured out a way to give half of them free parking and they wouldn't let me do it. She eventually gave up on the project. I, before, before we uh, just bash IRBs into oblivion, I want to try to make as good of a case as can be made for them. So, you know, we mentioned Tuskegee and of course everyone always, you know, when you have to do the city training, which I'm sure all of us sit down and do very carefully. But the other example that everyone always thinks of is the Nazis, you know, it's, it's the Nazis and Tuskegee. And I guess I'm wondering, what are, are there other examples of just heinous researcher behavior since the early 70s that I'm I'm just totally unaware of? I mean, sorry, there's several things are gone in my, my mind. First, it's really important to understand that research ethics is not, as Justice Holmes once said, a brooding omnipresence in the sky. There really isn't something up there called ethical research. It is a subject about which opinions differ because these are difficult human problems. And so what people regarded as unethical at one time may not be what we would regard as ethical now. Um, and in fact, as I understand it, there was something like 
a procedure to evaluate the Tuskegee study itself, um, which approved it. Whether that's true or not, I'm less clear. Um, but I spoke with a medical historian of some distinction who said, Carl, anybody who thinks that an IRB wouldn't have approved the Tuskegee study at the time when the study was being done is smoking heavy wheat. So, uh, so part of the trouble is that to say we need IRBs now because something that happened a long time in the past is probably not taking into account different understandings of what ethical research is. Now, nobody thinks that the Nazi research was was ethical. Nobody thought so at the time. And um, but it is weird, just weird, to say that the lesson of the Nazis is that we should give governments more power. IRBs are government agencies acting on behalf of the government and asserting more and more authority over how universities work. But the research that was done by the Nazis was done by the government. The Tuskegee study was done by the government. IRBs wouldn't stop. IRBs are directed at universities and other private institutions. It does not make sense to say that because German, there were German doctors who behaved abominably in the 30s, we, at the behest of the government, we should have a government agency regulating research. It's backwards. Have there been any studies, systematic studies, actually quantifying the value that IRBs provide or like doing that cost benefit analysis that you you said was was wanting has there been any attempt at this ever uh certainly certainly not by the time i published the book i have i have since then gone into um happier fields i i now work primarily in art law um one of the pleasures of being a law professor is that you can do anything you want to and um what you're bringing to it is not substantive knowledge that you're bringing legal skills to it. So, um, so law professors move around easily from one field to another. Um, but the argument for IRBs has never been that they are a, a net benefit. It's the argument is what I call an argument by scandal to say, look at the bad thing that happened. That can't happen again. Without asking first whether you can prevent it from happening again. I mean, one of the things that you learn when you think about regulation a lot is that there is no system of regulation that doesn't cause harm. They all have to be implemented and use resources, and nothing ever prevents anything. So one of the things I hear when I talk about IRBs is even one case of research misconduct is one too many. Well, obviously, anything bad shouldn't happen. But in an attempt to eliminate every possible research instance of research misconduct, you are going to be able to achieve your goal only if you shut research down completely. There is no way of preventing bad things from happening in human life. So part of the trouble is you just have to live with that. But the argument by scandal doesn't ask whether IRBs are a good way of preventing scandal from happening again. So one of the issues that you described a little bit about IRBs is the slowness of process from a researcher's perspective in order to actually conduct research. It's slowed down. It's a lot more expensive. We talked about event licensing. There are also some other interesting harms that IRBs cause with regards to uh, restricting enrollment. 
So one of the stated goals of IRBs is to protect vulnerable groups. And something that's kind of ironic as a result is the groups about whom we would like to have more data, such as women or children, are explicitly made more difficult to study. And the end result of that is we simply don't know as much about, say, women having heart attacks or the specific pharmacokinetics of particular pharmaceutical agents in children because we're explicitly prohibited from studying them without even more onerous uh, oversight from IRBs. It's one of the true perversions of the system that the people who need help the most get it the, get it the least in the name of protecting those people. My my brother died of schizophrenia. And um, when I talk with the people who would try to do research um, in schizophrenia today, they say it's, you know, we, we can't do it. It's just the, the prote so-called protections um, prevent us from finding ways of helping people who desperately need help. Uh, children um, eating lead. Um, are another example of an area where um, research is made more difficult by this supposed desire to protect the, the vulnerable. It's also um, another perversity of it is that in the name of protecting people's autonomy, potential research subjects are not allowed to decide for themselves what sort of risks they want to run. I mean, we We've just been talking about informed consent in medical situations where the whole idea is to say to the patient, you decide what kind of risks you want to run and how acute the risks are. But with research subjects, we say we're not going to allow you to decide because we don't think you can decide for yourself. We will decide for you. And then, then we will let you sign on if you want to, but we will not let you take risks we don't want you to run. And if that isn't paternalism, I don't know what is. Yeah, the recent example of this that has gotten a little bit of attention is human challenge trials, where early on in the COVID pandemic, there were many, many people who believed that uh, if we could just infect people who, who volunteer and are paid for their services, we, we could learn a lot more and develop, a, you know, the vaccine would be developed faster. And pretty much every, everyone agrees that it would have developed things faster. We could have gotten the vaccine faster. But there was hemming and hawing in the bioethics community about this. It was seen, well, you know, if you're paying people, is that a form of coercion? And the people who are most likely to do it are, are the most vulnerable. And, and unfortunately, it wasn't seen for what, what I think is a, a more accurate um, uh, perspective, which is that these people who wanted to volunteer were, were heroes, that this was a heroic act that, I mean, most of the people who were doing this were very low risk for, for dying to begin with. These are people in their twenties who, who need money and, uh, or want money and are, were not the group that was most in danger of dying from COVID. And they said, well, I'm willing to do this. I want to help science. I want to help other people. And it'd be nice to also get paid for it. But they weren't allowed to actually do it uh, because of this paternalistic streak within uh, you know, the, the IRB institution, OHRP institution. Uh, I don't think they were ever allowed to do it in the US. And it took a year for Britain to actually allow them to do it. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori an old Latin tag, which means it is sweet and proper to die for your country. We think those, the people who die for their country are heroes. And in fact, we force them to die for their country. And um, in the days uh, when I was of draft age, um, we let people die for very silly sorts of reasons. Every time I try to find something good to watch on one of my streaming channels, I keep being confronted with these people who ski down mountains and there, there are a whole, uh, seems to be a whole subculture of people who um, climb up rocks and 
fall off by the time they're 30. Um, we think that people should be able to decide for themselves what kinds of risks they want to run. And there is no life without risks after all, I anyway. Um, the idea that one of the most socially valuable kinds of risks to take can't be taken for these inane reasons, like their confusion about what coercion is, um, seems to me to be denying what most Americans would think is a, a desirable ethical system. Part of the weirdness of the IRB system is that it's turned Kant into the only legitimate source of ethical insight in a country where nobody knows who Immanuel Kant was and where people cannot understand what it means to say that you're treating, that you're not treating somebody as an agent. They can't understand. They can't, they can't, they can't, they can't, they can't understand it. Um, they can't understand it. Um, and how that became the governmentally enforced ethical system is a huge mystery. It it's an, it was an accident of mostly, I think, of Tom Beecham being the person who did the drafting. Yeah, there's a there's a quote in your book from Robert Amder, who wrote the IRB member handbook, which defines coercion in a very unusual oh, yes. way. So I'm going to read it because I, I just think it's it explains, I think, a lot of the reason that IRBs feel that people who run IRBs or read the, the IRB handbook, how they think about this sort of stuff, but it's so foreign from what a regular person thinks. So here, here's, here's what he wrote. Basically, coercion means that a person is to some degree forced or at least strongly pushed to do something that is not good for him or her to do. In discussions of research regulation, the term undue influence is often used to describe the concept of coercion. Coercion is a concept that is impossible to define beyond a certain point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like pornography, it is difficult to define, but you know it when you see it. Does your does your salary coerce you into going to work? If you say no, then consider whether you would quit if you didn't get paid. I, I just, I can't, yeah, I just, I don't even know what to say. I'm speechless. Don't I say that he makes a pig's breakfast of the idea? Yes, I think that that-, that I think I expression. do. Yeah. Um, this is- <sighs> Part of what happens when these kinds of things become bureaucratized is that you drive good people out of the field. No responsible scholar in a serious field would ever say the combination of things that you just read. So um, bio, I went into bioethics partly because it was an interesting area and it was made interesting by the Hastings Center report in large part, which brought together people who were serious scholars in real disciplines, like law, medicine, philosophy, theology. These were people with, who had mastered a discipline and then brought their disciplinary skills to talking about topics of interest to these disciplines. And that led to, a, to serious discussions by serious people. What sadly has happened is that bioethics has wanted to become a discipline of its own, but it isn't a discipline. It does not have a serious history of research and scholarship. It is an advocacy movement and not a scholarly movement. There is none of the kind of fundamental disagreement about things that you see in any serious discipline. And so you get people like Amder writing these things that are that don't make sense to ordinary people, that are in that are mutually contradictory 
and sometimes just crazy. And, and I was also offended by his reference to Jacobellus versus Ohio, which is the um, case in which Justice Stewart, for whom I, I worked um, after I finished law school, um, had said about pornography that he couldn't define it, um, but he knew it when he saw it. Um, that was partly a joke. It was intended to be funny. Um, it was also a, a uh, an oblique comment on his colleagues on the court who had been struggling to define uh, pornography for years and years and years and failed and who had reduced themselves to having to watch every obscene movie that came before the court in person. They went down to the basement of the court and they watched the movie. Um, and particularly sad since Justice Harlan was blind and so the junior justice had to sit by him and say, well, Mr. Justice, this is what they're saying, that was what they're doing now. And Harland, who was a very sweet elderly gentleman said, really? Extraordinary. That's just extraordinary. So that was Jacobellus versus Ohio. Yeah, the other interesting aspect of this is how it pushes things that used to be the domain of social science into the domain of say reality TV or journalism. So, you know, everyone learns about the Milgram experiment in psychology courses because it's so fascinating that you could get people, just normal people to, uh, to agree to shock someone who they didn't know if they were told by an authority figure. That, you know, I think everyone agrees that that's like valuable information to know as a society, yet there's no way that that would pass an institutional review board now. And there was a recent uh, TV show, I don't know if you've seen it, it's called The Push by Darren Brown, who's a mentalist. Uh, and and it, it came out a couple of years ago. And basically the premise is that they choose people based on, on certain experiments that they do who are the most suggestible and they put them in this really elaborate scenario where they slowly get them to commit uh, small, you know, morally questionable decisions. And the idea is that at the end of it, can they convince someone to push someone else off a building? And of course, there isn't someone who ends up dying in this, in this show, but it is absolutely riveting and fascinating to watch. And I feel like just watching it, you learn something about the human condition but of course, there's no way that would have passed an IRB. And so I have to go to a reality show, basically, to learn about that. Or if you said you were just writing an article about, let's say, terrorists, you wanted to interview a bunch of terrorists for an article for The Atlantic, that's okay. But the second you want to sort of systematize it and have it be published in an academic journal, then no. We need, you need, you can't get trust up front. You need to be, we need to review all of your communications. We need to make sure that you're, you warn them about this, you know, uh, revealing too much and all of these different things that just make it impossible to study in a serious way. And so what does it say? I, I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but what does it say about uh, our society that we can no longer do important research on certain topics. And instead, we let journalists who maybe probably have more biased thinking and, uh, and reality show mentalists uh, take over where the social scientists left off in the past. It is very bizarre to let journalists investigate these kinds of things and not serious social scientists. Um, and of course we do it because we can't stop them. Um, the First Amendment keeps the government from um, regulating journalists. And I think if you actually come down to it, um, the First Amendment does the same thing for other social scientists, but that's an issue you would have to litigate. Um, journalists have historically demonstrated very different 
ethical constraints than social scientists have. And that's part of the um, irony. I think you're absolutely right that we are stopping ourselves from learning about things like terrorism by prohibiting scholars from actually talking to terrorists and trying to understand what is going on in their minds. Um, it is also, I think, bizarre to be regulating social science in this kind of way, because social scientists had been thinking about research ethics in serious ways, in informed ways, long before IRBs came on and um, and had developed rules about confidentiality. And the rules weren't stable. They kept developing as, as new kinds of issues came along. Um, but I think another thing that, um, that drives a lot of the support for IRBs is that people imagine that, research, that medical research is terribly dangerous. Um, and that's just not true. There, it can be terribly dangerous, but very little of it is terribly dangerous. A lot of it can be done without having any contact with the patient at all through um, things like looking at medical records. Um, some of the things that look dangerous are dangerous because of the illness and not because of the treatment. Um, the kinds of examples that you were suggesting earlier of two different treatments um, both of them in current use, and what you try to do is to figure out which one of them actually works and which one doesn't. Um, it may be that one is, uh, the, the hope is that one is better than another, um, but the patients aren't running any additional risk because you're doing research instead of randomizing them by the preference, by the uninformed preferences of their physician. Um, and and even the research that, so it's, I think, a misunderstanding that IRBs rely on that, in, uh, not deliberately rely on, but that makes it easier for them to make their case, um, that people think medical research is almost always a very dangerous thing when it actually almost never is a very dangerous thing. And even if it is a dangerous thing, it's the kind of thing you were suggesting earlier that people are entitled to take risks for if they want to. Yeah, and some of the, you know, the example that's coming to mind from your book is I think it was a guy named Provenost at Johns Hopkins. The idea was let's prevent try to prevent central line infections by just having a checklist. Let's just have a checklist. There'll be a nurse there. If the doctor forgets to wash his hands or her hands, the nurse will be like, hey, doctor, you forgot to wash your hands. We need to check this off the list. And it was okay for Johns Hopkins to implement this at their facility and see their central lines go down to like zero. And it was okay for them, for those procedures to be adopted by another hospital but the second that they actually wanted to collect data on how it was going to publish it in a paper no 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 that's human subject data research you no longer are allowed to do that and it's things like that where i don't even know who's really at risk from a checklist um there's another example i i, I can't get out of this episode without sharing my irb story so i was at ucla I was working uh, for a psychiatrist who was study, studying Tai Chi, the effects of Tai Chi on depression. And, oh, this the yeah, exactly the the moving around and and uh, I remember that when it came time for I, our IRB audit, we had to close down like the entire lab. I want to say it was like for four four days or so. And literally all of us, all we did was compile paperwork for them to, to look through. And the, the comments that came back after this very extensive IRB where we shut down our research, which 
was probably of, of questionable value, but uh, definitely was not dangerous. Uh, the, the comments was were all things like this, the color of the pen that you used, it, it's a different shade of blue than we want. So this has, to, this data can no longer be included. It was things like, it, you know, it was ridiculous things like that. Oh, the person signed and they over crossed out some, some parts so you can't see what's under it. This data is, you know, you can't use this. You need to, you need to figure out a way to, to fix this. And what a waste of, what a waste of everybody's time. And if the research had been absolutely first rate and relevant to some really pressing issue, they still would have said, here's this information you've collected that's reliable information. Nobody's been harmed in getting it and it can't be used. I, I keep getting stories from friends about the destruction of research be on the whim of an IRB. It's, I, I have um, refused to be on an IRB because I think it's immoral, um, but I have attended a few IRB meetings and one of them was at the US Air Force Academy um, where there was a researcher who was um, doing a study on knees and he had the cadets um, step up and down on a stool that was about a foot high. And the, the IRB was interesting because the IRB was made up of people who wanted to get on with life, but they were also rule abiding people and they understood themselves to have been instructed to be obstreperous and obstructionist. And so they grilled this poor guy for half an hour. And then I went out into the sunlight and saw what happens to the cadets all of the rest of their day when they're jumping out of airplanes, um, flying gliders around the Rocky Mountains, um, being um, pressed physically to their outer limits, playing football. Um, it just, the ludicrousness of this inquiry into the well-being of people who, whom the Air Force felt free to put to any purpose it, it thought might be useful or amusing, um, including having them, you know, flying planes that are unsafe at any speed. The people on the IRB said to me, you know, we think this is crazy. We just, we think it's absurd to be looking into these kinds of things given the, the life that these people have signed up for. But um, but they, they said, we don't like any of the things that we're doing, but we believe that we've been instructed to do that. And so we will keep doing it. And there's I a think weird, there's a weird parallel with like Milgram there, actually. That is a very that's a very witty uh, comparison. I like it. So I want to I want to just take a step back and I want to talk about what what we can do to maybe change things a little bit. But before we get there, you know, my it's my understanding that not all IRBs are created equal. You know, the the ones that are potentially maybe at bigger academic centers tend to be more obstructionist than the IRBs that are run by more private organizations that still want, because you need IRB approval in order to get your research published. So you need, you usually need to have some form of an IRB process, but it's not like every IRB acts the same way. Uh, so I guess my question is, did you why is it that certain IRBs are worse than others? And is there any way, even if we weren't able to make giant changes to the system, that we could tilt the balance toward IRBs being, you know, maybe maybe you should be on an IRB. You would be a valuable person to uh, counterbalance the uh, the prevailing attitude. Although you you know you'd probably be bored out of your mind. But um, but yeah, I guess I'm sort of curious if you've thought at all about how to tilt. IRBs at certain places that are worse to be more like the IRBs that are still IRBs, but maybe are less um, less bad. Well, the best way to uh, 
to, and I think uh, perhaps the only way to make a real difference is litigation. Um, what you need to do is to take somebody at a state school because um, it, what the IRB does is then action by the state. And you need to sue them on due process grounds and on First Amendment, meaning free speech grounds. Um, I think there is an excellent case to be made. It's difficult to find a plaintiff because you have to find somebody who doesn't care about his future in the institution. You have to find somebody who's willing to um, uh, take the risk that the IRB will never approve another thing that he does. Um, but um, there are, uh, that, is a, that is a problem that can be overcome. Um, my, one of my own flights of fancy was that we ought to tell researchers that if they get IRB approval for their research, they will be held harmless um, in any suit against them for having done harm during the research. So that it's a, what lawyers call a safe harbor. If you get IRB approval, you're immune from suit. And then let the researchers themselves decide whether they want to take the shelter of an IRB or whether they're willing to uh, go it on their own. I, because of what I said about the safety of most research and because researchers are not people who have set out in life to try to do harm to other human beings. They're trying to figure out how to make things better for other human beings. So they are inhibited from doing harms, not completely, of course, but in significant ways by their own sense of duty to the research subjects and um, their own professional ethics. Um, so I think most researchers would say, the hell with the IRB, I'll go it on my own. Um, it, the people who can make the most difference are doctors. Um, it is through the medical schools that this insidious virus has entered the university. It's, the, it's I think, the only place it really could have gotten in so easily. Um, but um, if medical researchers say, as they would be right in saying, we are losing human lives because our research has been so impeded by these institutions. Um, I think that the perception of IRBs would change a lot. Um, I think part of the trouble is that individual researchers don't know what it's like for everybody else. And so they can say to themselves, well, it, maybe it's better at other schools. Maybe it's better for other people. Maybe I just had a bad experience with an IRB. But um, that's not true. Um, it's um, the structure of IRBs that makes it inevitable that you will get these disastrous consequences. Um, so I think any kind of activity that says to other people in academic in the academic world um, this is a serious problem in medical research um, as well as in social science research um, could help to generate faculty hostility to irbs that would do some good. That's a great study idea. I mean, it would just be a survey of large numbers of researchers and just, you know, I don't know if it would be qualitative or quantitative, but just sort of, you could, you could imagine a study on this topic where you could put out some data on what percent of, of researchers uh, actually uh, felt hindered and how hindered, uh, how much, what, like what extra cost was assumed by having to abide by demands or um, commentary that they didn't actually think was worth it. Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm imagining the study 
that you could you could easily uh, put together. I don't know what that would be like for maybe you would in, you know maybe asking maybe an IRB would uh, consider that study unethical in some way because it's questioning this this great service that they do for for humanity. But you also need more than a study. I mean, the study gets published, and then what? Um, you need people saying in public. Um, and one of the things that uh, I thought of at one point was trying to approach illness groups, the American Heart Association, or or any group that's interested in a in an illness, and say, do you know how much of your research dollar that you're that you're spending here goes to supporting this useless and one might also say redundant system because funders um, very commonly have their own ethical review of, of studies. So, um, so you're getting several different agencies asking the same question. So I think it has to be public and it has to be um, advocates. It's, and this is a terrible time to be trying to do this. Universities are the most timorous institutions in American society. They, they, for a variety of reasons, um, will not stand up on an issue of principle. And, and certainly the last thing that university presidents are chosen for is their willingness to, um, to make a fuss about this kind of thing. So it really has to come from the faculty and and it has to come from the faculties that are most affected um i i have never i haven't talked about irb as much with my colleagues since my research has moved on recently but um for years i would say to my law school colleagues um you know that you're supposed to have your research approved by irbs and they say, what are IRBs? And I say, well, um, and they say, that can't be right. That's ridiculous. Nobody would want to regulate research like that. That's crazy. Um, and I say, yes, it is crazy. And yes, you're supposed to be getting um, your work approved. Um, and I think um, a lot of them just ignore the requirement because their research um, doesn't require very much money and um, and is doesn't um, isn't easily noticed by the people who live in IRBs. Um, so it really, which is too bad because law professors are prepared to, will not find it hard to make the kind of arguments about IRBs that I've been describing. I think that the place that would be most influential is medical schools. So. Um, so, but I think part of the problem there is that physicians, and not just physicians, have allowed themselves, a lot of physicians have allowed themselves to be bamboozled by the ethicists who say, this is what research ethics is. The kind of things that um, uh, Daniel was discussing um, are examples of ethics that no serious ethicist would take seriously. And, um, but I've certainly talked with a lot of physicians who tell me some crazy thing an IRB has done and then say, well, I didn't know that was unethical. So, so part of the trouble is they've been around long enough, they're institutionalized enough, and they're confident enough that they are able to persuade people that their version of ethics is a real version of ethics. We actually just wrote a uh, recent short piece about medical education in uh, Substack, uh, Sensible Medicine. Uh, and in that, we talk about how medical school admissions process, like a lot of admissions processes, uh, select for conformity, and it seems like one of the one of the issues with having physicians or other people speak out on this particular issue is the selection pressure for becoming a medical student, getting a good residency, becoming a fellow, getting research funding. You know, you're not going to be well served by making big waves, which is why the uh, 
attempt to find somebody who is uh, just doing a little bit of research and then is, you know, has something else lined up afterwards that they're going to, it's going to, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be tough. It definitely research itself is something that uh, while it's very prestigious to have lots of publications after your name, preferably those of low quality that you can mass produce to have lots of, lots of things listed after your name. Um, the general bureaucratization of actually getting anything meaningful done, I think dissuades people from even trying in the first place. And that's sort of one of the, I know that it's difficult for people who try and then fail, but it's also people who just like, why bother that? I don't, here's this 30 page document I have to fill out just to start an application. Why I have better things to do with my time. I'll write, write something or. This has to come from very senior people. It, um, they're, a lot of them aren't doing research anymore. Um, and if they are, they're in a position where it's much harder to get in their way. Um, at a junior level, it's, um, it just doesn't make sense to try to take on the system in, in, a way that exposes you to danger from IRBs. Uh, I wanted to ask you two, is, is there a hope? <laughs> um, is there a hope? Uh, I'm not sure. Mitch, do you, do you think there's any hope? <laughs> I don't think so in the current climate of radically throwing out. I mean, I, I think that legislation is something, excuse me, not legislation, uh, court cases is something that I hadn't seriously considered. That's probably the most viable pathway for instituting vast changes from a kind of top-down perspective with um, litigation rather than a sort of legislative legislation approach. You'd be hard-pressed to find a lot of uh, senior level deans currently who would be willing to stick their their necks out in, in this way. That's my assessment of the landscape at the moment. Out of curiosity, when you published the censor's hand and in the you know intervening years since then, what has the response to it been like? Have you gotten a lot of pushback on this book? No. Um, after the book came out, I, I did uh, um, give a talk at the University of Indiana Medical School, and I met with the head of, with I think the head of their IRB system, who kept saying, I can't believe you think that the IRB system should be abolished. Did you really say that? I can't believe it. And I think in the bioethics world, insofar as they've ever heard of of me or this idea, they just regard it as bizarre. Um, the, um, the social scientists by and large haven't read it because it doesn't come into their ken, but um, uh, we got a couple of blurbs from distinguished social, very distinguished social scientists whom I didn't know. Um, and um, I heard privately from both of them. They not only wrote really nice blurbs, but they wrote me individually and, and said, I couldn't believe it. And Howard Becker, who is a very distinguished sociologist, um, said, um, no book I've ever read has made me angrier than this book because it's even worse than I had thought. And, and it seems so hopeless. So um, I, I've been out of the field for seven years. I'm not paying attention, but um, I certainly um, don't get any sense that anybody's um, paying much attention to it. Everybody, everybody I talk with individually thinks that, um, that IRBs are, as somebody said, the crabgrass of the university, um, horrible but spreading. It, you you have a much better sense than I do, I think, because you've been interested in um, these problems and you're in the heart of the beast. <laughs>
Well, Carl, thank you so much for joining us in the External Medicine Podcast. But before we close, is there anything that you were really dying to talk about that we did not ask you about? You should never ask a law professor a question like that. (laughs) (laughs) um, Let me just say what I actually feel. uh, this has been very interesting. I've enjoyed talking with you both. I think you're asking excellent questions. Um, how do, do I subscribe to your podcast? Is there some way of hearing more of these? Yes, you can subscribe to our podcast. We are on YouTube. You can just YouTube external medicine podcast, or we're Terrific. also available on uh Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and many, many other podcast providers of your choice. So if people are interested in reading your book, Sensor's Hand, Misregulation of Human Subject Research is available on Amazon or at a local bookstore near you. Um, And um, if they're interested in learning more about you or your work, is there any place on the internet that you would direct people to go? Uh, if you just Google me, the first thing that shows up is um, my page on the university's site. And it um, also has, um, I believe, uh, a link to my CV, uh, my resume. So um, if people really want to read um, more about a lot of fascinating legal issues, uh, they're welcome. Uh, they're welcome to do that. And um, the book on um, mandated disclosure is called more than you wanted wanted to know um, and that was intended to be something that is accessible to um, to educated people of all kinds um, and um, so it's written um, in a a serious but not um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, it's written in a serious way for people uh, of all kinds of backgrounds. Excellent. Well, thank you once again. It's, uh, it's really been a pleasure to meet with you and, and chat with you for a little bit. The pleasure is mine, and um, I'll look forward to hearing more from you um, as your distinguished careers develop. All right. Thanks very care. much. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. 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 If you'd like to support us, here are some ways you can help. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends. 